Yo, what is going on everyone? My name is Nick or The Notorious Fantasy and in today's video, we're going to be going in depth into my week number 15 wide receiver start or sit decisions for the 2023 fantasy football season. Inside of today's video, we're going to be going in depth through every single matchup from Thursday night football, through all the games on Saturday, all the way up until Monday night football. And I'll be telling you guys whether I think you should start or sit the wide receivers in all of those games. But before we could get on into things, I would like to ask that if you guys are new to the channel and you do end up enjoying today's video, that you please make sure to hit that subscribe button down below. And while you're down there, whether you are new to the channel or not, please make sure that you do leave a like on today's video. It would help me out a ton. If you want to follow me on Twitter or X, please Please do so at Notorious FNTSY. So without further ado, let's get into my week 15 wide receiver start or sit decisions for the 2023 fantasy football season. We begin with a luxurious Thursday night football matchup. The Los Angeles Chargers at the Los Vegas Raiders in Viva Las Vegas. Now, when it comes to the Chargers now with AI generated quarterback Easton Stick under center, I have to believe up against the Raiders defense that Allen should be at minimum a top 24 wide receiver. Now, obviously, he's going to fall down the rankings without Justin Herbert, the pervert, right? Prior to this injury, Keenan Allen was like a top five, top eight guy weekly in my rankings, and now he's fallen down the rankings quicker than the Dolphins are falling down a lot of people's NFL power rankings. I will still more than likely have him ranked as a top 12 wide receiver, but he is definitely far from a safe bet with Easton Stick under center. Ultimately, I feel like Easton Stick is just going to pepper him with a bunch of targets, but the touchdown upside is obviously limited. Quinton Johnston has ripped off back-to-back -back top 38 games at the wide receiver position, which to me is honestly surprising considering how dog shit he looked this season when given a bunch of opportunities. Even if a QJ breakout was on the brink, right? We are about to see Quinton Johnston have a banger finish to the year with Stick now starting for the rest of the year. No Justin Herbert. There is no reason to fall into the Quinton Johnston trap. Jalen Guyton, another guy, right? If he, this guy was going to magically transform into Calvin Johnson or something, that ain't happening. Without Justin Herbert, Guyton should be on your waivers. For the Raiders, it has been a disappointing year for Devontae Adams in Las Vegas, right? Because you know deep down that Devontae Adams is still Devontae Adams, right? We saw a similar thing last night with the Dolphins up against the Titans, right? DeAndre Hopkins is still DeAndre Hopkins, but he's stuck in a shitty scenario. And I think that's the same case with Adams. He's just being let down by his quarterback play. Up against the Chargers defense, he should be fine as a middle-of-the-road wide receiver, too, that has upside due to his talent. But again, it's not like you're super excited to start Devontae Adams this week. Now, Jacoby Myers, from the start of the season, that guy that was on fire ripping off top 16 games like it was nothing... That is not the same Jacoby Myers we have now in week number 15. Now, I get that that guy is still deep down there inside of him. Pause, right? He still could unleash a huge game. But even against the Chargers defense, I think you should leave him on your bench. Hunter Renfro, ever since Josh McDaniels got fired, we have seen Renfro blossom into a guy that sees a lot more targets. But even with getting more targets in an Aiden O'Connell offense that doesn't make you a guy that someone would want to start, he hasn't cracked the top 40 all season long at the wide receiver position, and there's no reason for me to think that's going to change even up against the Chargers. Next up, we move to the first game on Saturday. We got three games on Saturday, so clear your schedule. The cold like Minnesota Vikings at the Cincinnati Bengals, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Saturday. Now, the most recent report from Adam Schefter tells us that Justin Jefferson, Jay Jettas, has a chance to play in week 15 with a chest injury that ended up sending him to the hospital during that game against the Raiders. Just a real high scoring back and forth affair. Obviously, I'm just kidding. If he does play, I would be willing to put my blinders on and start him because he's Justin Jefferson, right? If this was 99% of the receivers in the NFL with nine inch Nick Mullins as the starting quarterback, I would probably tell you to sit him. But because 
it's Justin Jefferson because it's the playoffs. You don't want to get cute. And if Justin Jefferson starts, sit him. And then he explodes for 30 fancy points on your bench. And then you can't sleep for a week, right? So Justin Jefferson, if he plays, he just has to be in my lineup. I get last week he screwed you over by getting hurt, but very hard to predict injuries in the NFL. Jordan Addison Ray, even if Jefferson misses, there is a 0% chance that I'm playing Addison. Zero. No shot. He has been straight up dog shit for three weeks in a row. I am officially done with Addison. Friendship ended with Addison. It is just no bueno for Mr. Addison. KJ Osborne saw his highest amount of targets since week eight with seven last week against the Raiders in Vegas. He turned that into, drum roll please, four receptions for 15 yards. KJ, frankly, just isn't that good and he should be on your waiver wire, not even close to your roster. Jamar Chase had only four targets last week for three receptions with 29 yards in a game where the Indianapolis Colts got absolutely butt-fucked, right? The Bengals' offense was explosive. I'm sure Sean McDermott was watching that explosive show, was like, ooh, look at that. I still have to believe, even against the Minnesota Vikings defense, that Chase will hop back on the saddle, Clint Eastwood style, this week. He is a must-start wide receiver every week. I think Jake Browning locks onto him a little bit more this week. Tee Higgins did outscore Jamar Chase last week with two receptions on four targets for 72 yards. With that said, I just can't get myself to play Higgins as he has seen four or fewer targets ever since returning from his injury. Even if Jake Browning looks like the second coming of Tom Brady yet again on Sunday or on Saturday, technically because this game's on Saturday, I just don't think that Higgins will end up feasting. Tyler, yeah, Boyd, when Higgins and Chase are healthy, regardless of how good you think Boyd is, right? I'm like one of the founders of the Tyler Boyd bandwagon. There's only one ball. Right? There's not two balls out there. There's one ball, Lance Armstrong style. So Boyd just kind of gets cucked out of targets. So he's a clear stay away. Next up, we move to the Pittsburgh Steelers at the Indianapolis Colts, 4 30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Saturday. Now, Michael Pittman Jr. has now ripped off three straight weeks coming out the bye as a top 12 wide receiver with 20 plus points in each game. Last week, despite the fact that that they lost to the Bengals. He ripped off eight receptions on 11 targets for 95 yards. I get that the Steelers' defense is by far the best defense that Michael Pittman and the Colts will go against in that long stretch of games where Michael Pittman was really good. But we just saw Bailey Zappi dick that defense down. So I believe that Pittman is a must-start wide receiver due to his consistency ever since Gardner Minshew took over Fire up Michael Pittman Jr. with supreme confidence. Now, for the other Colts, things kind of go down. Beginning with Josh Downs. Haha, <laughs> so funny. Josh Downs' targets have deflated quicker than the Patriots football in Indianapolis in the playoffs all those years ago. Just three targets last week for three receptions and 32 yards last week. While I still believe Downs is a solid player against the Pittsburgh Steelers defense, I would sit him down Chris Hansen style. Alec Pierce had a solid outing in week 13 against the Texans, or the Titans, I should say. I don't know why the fuck I said Texans. Up against the Tennessee Titans and followed that up with four fantasy points last week. Great. No need to start him. For the Pittsburgh Steelers, despite Mitchell Trubisky looking like Ray Charles trying to throw the ball up against the Patriots defense last Thursday, Deontay still had three receptions on seven targets for 57 yards and a touchdown, making it now two weeks in a row with a touchdown for Deontay Johnson. Deontay Johnson is like that one friend that you know that just never gets laid, and then two weeks in a row, they're able to do it. They're able to bring a chick home from the bar. It's like, holy fuck. Give him a nice round of applause. That's what Deontay Johnson just did, man. He scored two touchdowns in the last two weeks. That's crazy. Even in a good spot here against the Colts defense, though, Deontay Johnson is in the wide receiver three range due to the fact that Mitchell Trubisky just isn't very good. And to be honest with you, he's worse than small hands Kenny Pickett. George Pickens, a.k.a. NFL young boy, had five receptions on six targets last week for 19 yards. He just hasn't been very reliable all season and... You know, you don't have to be the most reliable guy for me to start you in fantasy football, 
but there hasn't even been that much of a spark for George Pickens this year, so I'm just going to stay away. Allen Robinson has had three or fewer targets in three straight games, and there's no way you're starting the wide receiver three in a Mitch Trubisky offense in the Lord's year of 2023, so don't be starting Allen Robinson. Next up, we move to the Denver Broncos at the Detroit Lions to close out the Saturday slate before we hop on to Sunday. If you guys have enjoyed this far, make sure you guys hit that subscribe button down below, and whether you are new to the channel or not, please make sure you leave a like on today's video. It would help me out a ton. So when it comes to the Denver Broncos, Cortland Sutton is just the clear alpha, the clear wide receiver one in this offense. After scoring a touchdown last week, Sutton has no, now scored a touchdown in 10 out of 13 games. Now going up against the Lions defense that I wouldn't even wipe my ass with. He has a good shot to do it yet again. Start Sutton up with confidence. I really do believe he is close to a lock to be a top 20 wide receiver. He's done it in four of the last five games. And again, this is a cupcake soft serve matchup against the Lions defense. Jerry Judy has really been at large a huge disappointment ever since he's been drafted out of Alabama in 2020. Judy's a guy that had a lot of pedigree coming out of college. I still don't think that Judy's like washed or a bust by any mean, but it really feels like he needs to just go to a different team to do something. I still like the talent, but with Cortland Sutton cooking up like Bobby fucking Flay out there, there's no reason to play Judy. Marvin Mims is a sit. He's an awesome guy to watch very fast, but the volume just really isn't there for him. For the Lions, I know there was a lot of people that were disappointed, disgruntled with Amon Ra's performance. I know a couple of people ended up missing the playoffs because Amon Ra St. Brown had a disaster of a game, right? It wasn't one of those games where it's like, oh, it's okay. You scored eight points. Obviously, it wasn't the best, but it could have been a lot worse, right? You could have really shit the bed. He shit the bed against the Chicago Bears in Chicago. Three receptions for 21 yards on three targets. Now, I get that the matchup against Denver is far from a wet dream, but we do know Jared Goff plays a lot better, not in the cold, right? He plays a lot better in the dome, and that makes me just believe that Amon Ross St. Brown will bounce back as a top 12 wide receiver this week. Jameson Williams has gotten just one target in two straight weeks. His skill is still very present out there when he's getting the targets, but again, if you're a three or fewer target guy, I'm not really taking that risk on you in the playoffs. Josh Reynolds did score last week, which is great for him. But against the Broncos, for Reynolds to score, I don't really think that's going to happen. So I would sit him down. Next up, we move to the Chicago, Chicago Bears at the Cleveland Browns. This is the beginning of the one o'clock Sunday slate. So DJ Moore has looked like Salma Hayek in dust till dawn over the last three weeks. If you know, you know, if you've seen that movie, you know what I'm talking about, right? Meaning he is scorching hot. He is on fire NBA jam style ever since Fields got back as the starting quarterback of the team. The tide of the season has completely done a 180 for DJ Moore last week in a big fat W against the Lions. He had six receptions on 10 targets for 68 yards. One yard off of being very nice. I like with 69 with three rushes for 20 yards and two total touchdowns as the wide receiver number three. Now I get Nick, the Browns defense is this. The Browns defense is that at the end of the day. I get the Browns defense is great, but I really think that DJ Moore might be able to exploit them. I think DJ Moore could easily be a top five wide receiver on the weekend. Based upon how Justin Fields has looked, you gotta fire up DJ Moore. Now, Darnell, here comes the Mooney, had his highest amount of targets last week since week number one with seven targets for 44 yards. Even with Justin Fields playing great, any pass-catching weapon not named DJ Moore or Cole Komet are clear sits, especially considering that this matchup on paper is a little bit spooky, a little bit scary. So then we got Tyler Francis Scott Key as the wide receiver three on the Bears. He had two receptions last week for 23 yards. Now, he isn't a bad player by any means, but... They're not starting him, right? We already made that very, very clear. For the Browns, Amari Cooper got force-fed the rock last week with 14 targets, 7 receptions for 77 yards against the Jacksonville Jaguars. 
This week, he plays against a Bears defense that is sneaky good. Now, they're pretty solid against the run, not as much against the pass, but I would throw them in the sneaky good category because I think most people at this point in the season still assume that the Bears defense sucks donkey cock, and they really don't. Now, Cooper is in a fringe start range right now for me. Because again, while Joe Flacco looked great, like this is still Joe Flacco we're talking about. So, is Cooper really going to get 10 plus targets this week? I don't know. So, he's just barely a start, right? If you have a lot of other options, I'd probably just advise for you to stay away and bench him. Elijah Moore, even with cool Joe Flacco looking solid, Moore just never does much with the targets that he gets, right? Even if he gets like eight plus targets this week, which is very plausible, shout out the Mythbusters. This week, I just don't think he'll do enough to be start worthy because he hasn't done it all season. Cedric Tillman is the third weapon on a Joe Flacco offense. Ain't no way you were even considering starting him. Next up, we move to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at the Green Bay Packers. Now, Mike Evans was a guy that a lot of people had ha ha hopes for last week, right? Everyone banging the drum in unison, a bunch of drummer boys, right? Just talking about Mike Evans, how great the matchup is up against the hot Atlanta Falcons. And he shit the bed. He tried to get up out of the bed, tried to run to the bathroom, and it was just a schmear of shit down the hallway all the way up until the bathroom, right? One reception on six targets for eight yards. But prior to that, Mike Evans was a very consistent wide receiver. So don't let one, one bad week rain on your parade. This is a matchup that Mike Evans should be back to his solid ways of being a top 10 wide receiver. So please, everyone, do not panic on Mr. Mike Evans. And we just saw this Packer defense get skull fucked by Tommy DeVito, the Italian stallion, the Bassin Bison. Godwin has been very disappointing this season. Now, if you watch the games, I talk about this a lot, but he passes the eye test, right? He doesn't look washed or anything, but it's just he's not doing the most with his targets, right? He gets 11 targets, five receptions, 53 yards last week. I get the matchup is fine, but I don't want to play Godwin because I just know that I'm in for disappointment, right? I know what Chris Godwin is this season. It's week 15, right? Not week five, it's week fucking 15. We've seen it all year long. He hasn't cracked the top 30 since week eight, which feels like a decade ago. At this point, I just cannot play him. Trey Palmer is a good enough of a wide receiver to be valuable on a different team. But in Tampa, you know, it's not one of those where there's only one ball, right? There's just not enough targets to go his way. There's too many cooks in the kitchen in Tampa Bay. For the Packers, Jaden Reed went off on Monday Night Football against the Giants in MetLife with eight receptions on 10 targets for 24 yards with four rushes for 38 yards and a touchdown. Against the Buccaneers defense, I certainly believe that Reed can be a top 12 wide receiver yet again. Now, we are assuming that Watson is out. And we talk about this a lot, right? An assumption can make an ass out of you and me. So I'm not saying that it's a mortal lock of the century, right? Obviously, you can't bet on who's in or who's out, but I wouldn't take out a second mortgage on my fucking house, right? I wouldn't sell my computer to place a bet on Christian Watson missing because I know he could easily come back. But even if he does play, saw it earlier in the season. The Packers love to ease guys in, right? Just the tip technique ease him in, and then a couple of weeks from now, then we'll see him kind of at full mast. But right now, he's going to be like one-fourth chub if he plays. So I think he'll be limited enough to leave Reed in the driver's seat as the wide receiver one. Reed is a low-end wide receiver two for me this week against the Bucks. Now, if Watson does play, and even if it's in a limited fashion, which I believe it will be if he plays, that I just hinted about before, that would be enough for Dobbs to go from a start to a sit because... Having that added competition for Dobbs, again, while he's a solid player, didn't do too well last week, so it just seems like a risk management scenario where there's just a little too much risk if Watson plays. If Watson doesn't play, then Dobbs will be a lower end wide receiver three, another one of those fringe start type of guys. Dontavian Wicks, if Watson misses, he'll be the number three guy. Last week, he saw six targets for two receptions of 20 yards. He isn't half bad. But half bad doesn't make you a fantasy football start. Next up, we move to game number seven, the Houston Texans at the Tennessee Titans. But before we break down this game in depth at the wide receiver position, 
as well as the rest of the week 15 slate. I would like to give you guys a quick word for our friends and our sponsor over at Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy is the best place to play Pick'em in the whole entire universe for the NFL, and they have a great offer for you guys today that we'll be talking about in just a couple of seconds, right after I explain how the NFL Pick'em game works. So we're we'll to be talking about one of the Saturday games here, the Steelers at the Indianapolis Colts, and we have to pick a minimum of two players from at least two different teams. So they have a bunch of games up right now as we get later on into the week. There are going to be more players to choose from. So we're going to go with, in this game, Steelers at Colts lower than 195 and a half passing yards for Trubisky. And we are going to go with higher than 79 and a half receiving yards for Michael Pittman. If both of these hit, we will receive three times our entry fee. So if you do $5, you'll get out $15. If you do three picks, then it would be six times your entry fee. Four picks is 10 times and five picks is 20 times, assuming all the picks hit. If you live in one of these states on your screen right now and use promo code Notorious Fantasy or Notorious or click on the link in the video description, if you are a new user, you will get a first match deposit bonus of up to $100. If you deposit $100, they give an additional $100, $50 additional $50, $25 additional $25. The minimum deposit on underdog is $10. If you have a gambling problem, please make sure you call 1-800-GAMBLER. Back on into things here, Texans at the Titans. Now, Noah Brown is a start. He has went two straight weeks without a catch, despite having seven total targets in both games combined. Without Nico, Cousin, Let's Go Bowling, Collins, and Tank Dell, Brown is going to be sucking in targets like his name was Kirby. The question lies now at the quarterback position. Who is going to be the signal caller, the starting quarterback for the the Texans in this game? Will it be Stroud or will it be Davis Long Neck Mills? While obviously it would feel a lot better to throw Brown into your starting lineup with the offensive rookie of the year under center, regardless of who plays, I still think that Brown would be a fringe start. Now, he feels very risky because again, so many targets, no catches over the last two weeks. Has a lot of upside. We've seen that upside. He has weak winning upside. He could put your team on his back. Darren Sharper, hold my dick. But even if CJ Stroud plays, it's not a guarantee that he has a blow up game. Without Nico and Tank, Robert Woods should be the wide receiver too in terms of targets. Regardless of who suits up as the starting quarterback though, are we really going to be starting Robert Woods in the year 2023, right? The answer is... Fuck no, baby. John Mechie, the second, actually the third. I apologize, John Mechie. Talking about your dad, I guess. Mechie has definitely disappointed me this season as I felt as though he would have a lot more involvement inside of this offense. Now, he has an opportunity. The door is wide open for him to get more targets. And, you know, maybe he does end up seeing that, right? But with how much we've seen out of Mechie, at the NFL level, which isn't much. Like, until he does something, he should be on waivers. For the Tennessee Titans, D-Hop looked like the Houston's DeAndre Hopkins over the last two weeks, and especially last week up against the Dolphins. Last two weeks, he's had 12 targets and a touchdown in both games. Last week in Miami, he took the Finns to Pound Town, right? It was like... That South Park episode, right, where the Japanese guys kill a bunch of dolphins, right? That's exact. Fuck are you, dolphin, right? That's what just happened to the dolphins. That's what Mike Vrabel and the Tennessee Titans did. They murdered us in cold blood. Seven receptions on 124 yards and a touchdown in a revenge spot against the Houston Texans. On principle, I have to start him. I get Levis might fall apart like that Post Malone song, but here got to do it. He's a middle of the road wide receiver two for me in my rankings. Then we got the other guys, right? Nick Westbrook, E. Kain, stuck the dagger into my Dolphins and twisted the knife, right? On that two-point conversion late in the game, which ultimately was the sinker for us, right? Sunk the Dolphins battleship. Besides that, though, we didn't really do much. The only guy we're starting in Tennessee in terms of wide receivers is D-Hop, so we're sitting Westbrook. Same thing goes with Burks, who really hasn't done anything since coming back from the injury. So he is in the clear sit range. Next up, we move to the New York 
Jumbo Jets at the Miami Dolphins. Now, Garrett Wilson went crazy last week with nine receptions on 14 targets for 108 yards with run rush for three yards. Against the Dolphins, I think that they're going to pepper him with targets again, just like they did last time these two teams played. I think having Zach Wilson under center is a lot better than having Tim Boyle, who was the starting quarterback last time these two teams played on Black Friday. Again, is the upside limited against the Dolphins' defense? Yes, I get. Nick, we just saw DeAndre Hopkins spit roast the Dolphins' defense, so clearly the upside's still there. Yeah, I guess, but it's Zach Wilson we're talking about after all. I figure he finishes somewhere from wide receiver 20 to 24. That just feels pretty fair to me. Xavier Gibson just isn't very good. No reason to start him. I know he scored a touchdown last week, but that ain't happening again. Al Lazard has two targets total over the last three weeks for zero receptions. This guy's absolutely atrocious. He's nothing without Rodgers. It's actually kind of sad. For the Dolphins, Tyreek Hill is day-to-day, leaving his availability for Sunday up in the air. If he does play, there's a chance that he's limited, kind of like watching the second half for the Dolphins where he's in, he's out, he's up, and he's down right all game long. If he does play, though, even if he's limited, I'm fucking playing him because he's really good. My dream, though, of him hitting 2,000 yards is probably taking the big dirt nap. Thanks, Titans, for hip-dropping Tyreek, you sorry bastards. Jalen Waddell should be fine, like he was last time these two teams played. He went 8 of 8 for 114 yards. If Tyreek doesn't play, I think the offense will have a much better game plan, right? I don't think the Dolphins' offense will completely fall off the edge of the earth without Tyreek like they did last week, but... Fuck, did that suck last week to watch. Again, I'm not going to go on some type of tangent. If you want to hear my Dolphins tangent, just watch the Jets Dolphins section of the running back start sit video from earlier today. I went off. I was very frustrated. I talked about in that rant how as the days go on, you know, you just... Now, I haven't forgot about it. You just kind of take it out of your mind, right? It, it doesn't affect me as much as it did last night, right? I was recording that video hours after the game happened. I was heated. And now it's like, whatever. Waddle's a low-end wide receiver two to a high-end wide receiver three this week. Again, the Jets' defense is pretty solid. Cedric Wilson, if Tyreek doesn't play, would be the wide receiver two, I would think. But they also got Braxton Berrios. They also have River Craycraft. Like, they have a lot of guys there. So, outside of Tyreek and Waddle, like, starting any of those other wide receivers is just getting too cute. Next up, we got the Kansas City Queefs, the Kansas City Chiefs at the New England Patriots. Now, the Patriots' defense... Despite having so many injuries, really showed up last week up against the Steelers. Now, I get, Nick, that's the Steelers' offense you're talking about. The Steelers' offense is not very good. I get it, right? And even despite the Chiefs' def- the Chiefs as a whole being a straight-up dumpster fire as of recently, I just don't know how they could lose this game. Now, if they really are frauds, they'll lose this game. But there's no way they should lose this game, right? This should be... Bet your whole fucking house on the money line. I know the odds wouldn't be bad or wouldn't be good, but you get what I mean, right? There's no way the Chiefs can lose this. Funny if they did, right? But I don't think there's a way that they lose this. Last week's loss against the Bills, Rice was balling like Damian Lillard with seven receptions on 10 targets for 72 yards and a touchdown as the wide receiver 12. Rice has become incredibly reliable Against the Pats, he is a low-end wide receiver, too, with solid upside. Because, again, he was the wide receiver 12 last week, right? He clearly has wide receiver one upside. Now we got the other chief, right? Stone hands, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, to me, he has a better chance of a rogue Chiefs fan just finding his way into the locker room and just punching him, socked him in the mouth, Geno Smith-style, breaking his jaw than he does of catching a ball over 30 yards. This man... (laughs) Smell him through the screen. He fucking reeks to high heaven. He shouldn't even be rostered. Justin Watson had that one solid game against the Eagles in week 11 as the wide receiver 17. Huge congratulations. Round of applause for him. But outside of that, the whole season has been a wash even after that. Back-to-back weeks with one or fewer targets. Leave Watson on the waiver wire. Now we got the Patriots. Now teach me how to Dougie. Teach me, teach me how to Dougie. Then Mario Douglas has missed the last two games with a concussion. If he is able to suit up, he should be back as the wide receiver number uno on the Patriots. He should have a fine game this week, but the upside is very limited, which is something that I really dislike in the playoffs, right? I'm not trying to wrap two condoms over my squad in the playoffs, right? I'm trying to hunt for that upside, right? 
go for broke. And Douglas is exactly the condom double wrap on your team, right? Which actually doesn't work. So just use one for any of you younger fellas out there. But I think, again, in the playoffs, you got to be shooting for the moon. And I think, sure, if you want 10 points, start Douglas if he plays. But if you want 15, 20 points, he just ain't getting that for you. Now, Juju Smith-Schuster, Corvette, Corvette, TikTok boy, got his revenge last week against the Steelers in Pittsburgh with four receptions on six targets for 90 yards, which was very clearly his best game of the season because outside of that week, he has been trash. One good game doesn't change my opinion, though. The wide receiver, 82 on the season. Not good. Sit him. Tyquan Thornton, I've always been a Tyquan Thornton guy ever since he entered the league last year, but he has shown small flashes. Last week, in his best possible scenario, because again, they had like three healthy wide receivers out there, he had three receptions on five targets for 17 yards. There is no need to play him. Next up, we move to Tommy DeVito and the Giants going up against Derek Carr. I can't possibly imagine a matchup with a quarterback that is so fun. I know, Nick, Tommy DeVito isn't actually that good, I know. Right, but it's so fun to watch him play, right? The fucking gabagula, right? The Italian stallion, the passing paisan versus Derek Carr. Derek Carr is so boring. He's like missionary sex with the lights off, right? You can't see anything, right? Tommy DeVito's over there doing the wheelbarrow position. Reverse cowgirl, cowgirl, doggy, all that shit that you can do, right? And then Derek Carr just so fucking boring. He really is, and... I don't even think, now this might be a crazy take. I don't think Derek Carr's team likes him. I think the team would rather have Jameis out there. Nick, that's a lie. You just made that up. I did make it up. I did. It came out of thin air, right? I didn't read that somewhere. I just made it up. It just seems like the team would rather have Jameis out there. Jameis is so much more fun. Olave had a down game last week against the Panthers, despite a great matchup with four receptions on five targets for 28 yards and a touchdown. I won't let that worry me, though, because Olave has been a very reliable wide receiver over the last five games. The Giants' defense may not be as bad as I previously thought that they were, but... I would be surprised if Olave got locked up, don't let me out, right? Just had a really bad game. Top 16 wide receiver at the very least this week. Hopefully that bum Derek Carr steps up and plays better. Because it does really hurt Chris Olave. And if Jameis was playing, I'm not even kidding. Chris Olave could score 35 fantasy points because Jameis does the fuck it. Olave's out there somewhere, just heaves it up a million times. Derek Carr's a pussy, doesn't do that. Nick, Derek Carr's actually a nice guy. I actually do think Derek Carr's a nice guy. I'm just so tired of watching him be a starting quarterback in the NFL. AT, AT, Perry. Shaheed missed again last week with a thigh injury. Regardless on if he plays or not, with Derek Carr throwing up ducks, I would just stay away from any receiver not named Chris Olave. So Lynn Bowden, he would be a sit as well. Juan Dale Robinson went crazy on Monday Night Football as him and Tommy Cutlets had a fiber optic connection. Shout out Christopher Maltasante. Six receptions on seven targets for 79 yards with two rushes for 37 yards. Every single week, though, DeVito has a new wide receiver one in terms of targets. So while Juan Dale had that great game outside of Saquon Barkley, you should just stay away from any giant. Jalen Hyatt is a real speedster, right? Shout out to Lightning McQueen. But with his volume ranging anywhere, like one week it could be one target. It could be seven targets. Like it just basically one to five targets every week. You're just not starting that. Slayton is another casualty of DeVito finding a new favorite target every week. He has solid upside due to the speed, but you just can't start him. Next up, we move to the Atlanta Falcons at the Carolina Panthers. Now, this is just... Torture to be put on television, right? The AFC or the NFC South, no one wants to watch this. No one gives a fuck. Whichever one of these teams gets into the playoffs is going to get hit with the 619 Rey Mysterio in the playoffs. This is a team that is going to get bent over a table in the playoffs, regardless of who it is. If it's the Falcons, it's not going to be the Panthers, obviously. The Saints, unless they start Jameis, then it'll be fun, right? But Falcons, Saints, the Bucks, it's like, I like Baker, but ugh. Ah, uh, they ain't winning a fucking game in the playoffs, man. I, I just don't see it. Grizzy Drake London had his best performance of the year last week against the Buccaneers with 10 catches on 11 targets for 172 yards. With Ritter as the starting quarterback, you still can't trust London, though. Right again, he has that big game. But Ritter's not good. 
So despite him being an amazing talent, he's just a middle-of-the-road wide receiver three because the quarterback is kind of holding him casualty. Van Jefferson has now had two games in a row with zero targets. He's not even rostered in like 32-team leagues, so I won't waste my time yapping about him. Adaryl Hodge actually got two targets last week and one catch for 18 yards. Congrats to him. Yippee! But ain't no way you're starting him even up against the Panthers' defense. For the Panthers, Adam Thielen has been so bad ever since the bye week. In week seven, it really has been night and day, right? At the start of the season, he was like a locked and loaded top 18, top 16 guy weekly. And he has transformed into a guy that barely finishes inside of the top 24 a majority of weeks. The volume has been there. And even with Frank Reich set on a one-way trip to Yafiredville, Thielen still is on the struggle bus. Far from an ideal start. And honestly, if I had Thielen and London on the same team, I'd rather just plunge, pluck my nose. Not pluck my nose. Plug my nose, I guess. I don't know why the fuck I said pluck. Plug my nose and just dump and jump deep into the deep end and play Drake London. Because again, like, like it, it, this might sound crazy. Is Desmond Ritter better than Bryce Young right now? Like, maybe. Maybe he is. Jonathan Mingo has gotten a whole lot of targets over the last two weeks with nine or more in each game. Last week, he had nine targets up against the Saints in the NO, resulting in two catches for 22 yards. I still think that Mingo is a good player. But with Bryce Young looking like Jamarcus Russell... I ain't starting Mingo. DJ Chark, do 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 baby Chark got smacked in the face with the ball on Sunday, and that was the highlight up against the Saints. Chark was a guy that I thought had promise in this league all those years ago in Jacksonville, but now in 2023, not even the wide receiver two on the Panthers. Sit him down. Next up, we move to the beginning of the four o'clock slate. We have just one, a two. A three game. Shout out to the Owl and the Tootsie Pop commercial. Just three games in the four o'clock slate. Got the Commanders at the Rams. Now, a couple of weeks ago when the Commanders were looking real feisty. Oh, that was fucking cringe. I don't know why I did that, but I'm leaving it in again. There's barely anything that gets edited out. I know people be like, Nick, that fucking sucked. That was stupid. Why'd you do it? It's because it just came to my mind. I didn't. I don't think I just do. Stupid is as stupid as, as they say. So, Kokonakua. A pairing Puka to Cooper Cup, they have both been real solid over the last two weeks. But ever since the bye, Puka has been by far the more consistent player. Last week against the Ravens in Baltimore, he had five receptions on eight targets for 84 yards with run rush for six yards. With Stafford turning back the clock to 2021, Puka is a must start for me against a not so hot Washington. Commander's defense. Cooper Cup has looked like his older self over the last two weeks. And he riddled off, riddled off, ripped off two top 18 performances in a row with a touchdown in both games. Last week in Baltimore, he had eight receptions on 10 targets for 115 yards and a touchdown. Going up against the Commanders, a defense that can't stop a nosebleed, Cooper Cup is a guy that you should definitely want to have in your starting lineup. Though, I will note that I have some reservations when it comes to Cup because he really fell apart from week 7 through 12, right? Again, Cooper Cup is still a great wide receiver, right? I'm not going to sit here and lie straight to your face, lie to the people and tell you that Cooper Cup sucks or something. But he just had some real down points this season that, again, just get stuck in the back of your head and you keep thinking about him and it kind of psychs you out on him. Demarcus Robinson, Chiefs legend, has now scored in back-to-back -back weeks and has gotten some real solid usage last week with three receptions on 10 targets for 46 yards and a touchdown. Even in a wet dream matchup here, though, I do expect Demarcus Robinson to come back down to earth. Then we got the Commanders. And while I'm a Terry McLaurin stan, can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. Terry's an interesting player because I still really do think that he's got all the talent in the world. But when push comes to shove, right? When you got to actually make the decision, we got to nut up and throw this guy in your lineup. You don't want to. He's been immensely underwhelming this season for a majority of it. And with the commander's offense fading quicker than the French Empire, I'm staying away from McLaurin. Jahan Dotson at points this season has shown up just like McLaurin. But for a majority of the season, he has been disappointing. 10 points. 
At this point, the season feels like his ceiling. He's a clear sit. Now, despite the woes of the commander's offense, I was running through the six with my woes. Samuel has looked solid in back-to-back -back weeks. Though coming out the bye, it's very plausible that Samuel loses that heat he acquired over the last two games. And with the Rams defense being a little bit sneaky, sneaky good, I am ducking and covering from Curtis Samuel. Next up, we move to the San Francisco 49ers at the Arizona Cardinals. Debo Samuel has now been a top 10 wide receiver in three straight weeks. And I don't expect the Debo train choo choo to come to a halt in a great matchup this week against the Cardinals. The 49ers team looks like, in my opinion, the best team in the NFL right now. And I expect them to walk the Cardinals like a dog. If he fell outside of the top 10, I would be genuinely shocked. Last week against the Seahawks, he had eight receptions on nine targets for 149 yards with one rush for two yards and two total touchdowns. He is the definition of of a must start. Now, Ayuk, on the other hand, has been worse than Debo. Now, don't take that as like a slight to Ayuk, right? They're like, oh, Nick thinks Ayuk sucks, right? I don't think so, right? Ayuk has been like wrapping a nice Trojan over your squad all year, but Debo has definitely surpassed him in my weekly rankings. Last week, he went six of nine. Very nice, I lack for 126 yards. This week, he should easily be a top 20 guy up against the Cardinals. I say this all the time about Jawan Jennings. He's a sit, but he's one of those guys that randomly once or twice a season will have four catches for 120 yards and two touchdowns. The problem is you will never actually know when that game will be. Even in a great, 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 great spot here, I would not get greedy and play him. Now for all the Cardinals, I'm sitting all the receivers, right? Since the Cardinals will likely be down bad pretty early here, right? They'll be getting dog walked, like I said. Early in the game, I think they're gonna have to throw a bunch, which opens up the door for a potential big showing out of Hollywood. The problem is that over the last five games prior to the bye, he hasn't been very good at all. And I don't expect that to magically change, magically transform up against the Niners defense. Michael Wilson has missed three straight weeks prior to the bye with a shoulder injury. Now, I'm no doctor, but I think he'll probably end up playing this week since they didn't put him on the IR. Regardless of if he plays or not against the 49ers defense, he would have to be an insane person to start him. Rondell Moore is a three-target-a-week guy on a team that is going to get spit-roasted. No thanks. No thanks. Next up, we move to the final game before Sunday Night Football and then Monday Night Football. We got the Dallas Cowboys at the Bills. The I would say the most interesting matchup, at least off the top of my head from what we've talked about today, best matchup. Cowboys at Bills. Are the Bills legit? Are the Cowboys legit, right? Now, I know the Cowboys just beat the Eagles. So yeah, they're definitely like legit. So I guess technically are the Bills legit, right? Because I think if the Cowboys lose this game, there's still a very good argument to be made that the, the Cowboys are like a top three team in the NFL, right? If the Bills lose this game, then the Bills are not eliminated from the playoffs because I think it's still possible, but like this really kind of shuts the door. Like I think that, again, I'm kind of speaking out my ass here. I think if the Bills lose this, then they start to, like, not control their own destiny. Then it's like, oh, we need this team to lose and this team to lose. Like, we need to win out. These teams need to lose that kind of scenario. It's like what the Dolphins are stuck in every year uh, with the playoff race where it's like, okay, now we need these three teams to lose. And then we, if we win, we magically get in, right? That's how the Dolphins got into the playoffs last year. Fuck that sorry team. I'm so sad about them. But it is what it is, right? We'll, we'll live. We'll live, you know? world still goes round and round. I still got all you guys that I love. So I appreciate all you guys. If you have enjoyed thus far, 40 plus minutes in, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button down below if you are new to the channel. So CD Lamb, ever since coming out the bye week, CD Lamb has been dominant. Chains and whips, 50 shades of gray style. Since the bye, he has been a top 12 wide receiver in five of seven games and has scored one or more touchdowns in six of seven games. Against a Bills defense, that doesn't really concern me especially with this being a potential shootout here. Lamb is a top three receiver for me and could easily be the wide receiver numero uno, head of the table. Shout out Roman Reigns. Brandon Cooks. Now, when it comes to Cooks, he's a start. I've been talking about Cooks' volume issue over the last few weeks, right? And it was really his downfall last week against the Eagles. Despite the Cowboys offense hitting the Eagles with some back shots, Cooks had two receptions on five targets for 37 yards. Now, he made up in the past for the lack of targets in the prior two weeks with a touchdown. But it's very clear at this point in the season that if Cooks does not score, 
you will have a sour taste left in your mouth, right? You will be very disappointed. So if you are going to play him, right, you now know, based upon what I told you, that, hey, he's very boomer bust. You play him, and he busts. Pause. Don't be sad, because you already have seen it coming. Now, matchup's definitely solid here, so I would start him as a lower-end, high-upside wide receiver three, but again, we have to acknowledge that four or five targets a majority of the weeks just does not cut it. I know he had that one game where he got a lot of targets, but... That's kind of one in a million for him. Michael Gallup actually caught the ball for once when he was throwing the ball last week against the Eagles. Holy fuck, man. Amazing, right? That crazy NFL receiver catches the ball when thrown to him. Al Lazard could learn a lot from Michael Gallup, right? Three receptions on five targets for 48 yards and a tug. Like I always say, a blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while, so stay away. For the Bills. Now, the Bills have a big win, a huge win, I might add, up against the Chiefs, and... The Bills offense had a real solid outing in Kansas City, but Diggs, nowhere to be found. Like John Cena, you couldn't see him. Four receptions on 11 targets for 24 yards as the wide receiver 52. The Cowboys defense is definitely one of the best in the league, best in the nation. But are we really going to get cute in the playoffs and throw Diggs down the rankings? The answer would be no. Diggs will be a top 12 receiver in my rankings, even if I'm not as confident in him compared to normal weeks. Gabe Davis is a sit this week, just mainly due to the matchup. He put up a goose egg last week, but I still think my thought process on declaring him as a start is correct because the process is that he has that weak winning upside, right? He's got that dog in him where he doesn't need a crazy amount of targets, but he could get over 100 yards and multiple touchdowns. His floor is also the basement. Shout out to Ron Stewart. So with him being a risky investment weekly against a stout defense, that is a clear scenario where you want to stay away. And now I say, like, sit Gabe Davis, right? He's going to go for three catches, 150 yards, two tugs, right? Because that's just what's going to happen. Khalil Shakira, Shakira. Khalil Shakir of the Buffalo Bills had just one target last week. He is basically the great value version of Gabe Davis. Again, while the upside is there, the matchup is too rough to start him. Next up, we move to the Baltimore Ravens at the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, Zay Flowers has ripped off two straight games as a top eight wide receiver against both of the LA teams last week against the Rams in that overtime W. He had 10 targets for six receptions with 60 yards and a touchdown. Against the Jaguars, I think he could do that yet again, but Flowers is another one of those boom or bust guys. He could just as easily be a top eight guy again as he could be the wide receiver 45, right? So it's just as easy for him to go absolutely insane in the membrane as it would be for him to be the wide receiver 45. Now, I'm still going to start him, but we'll acknowledge that the downside is there. OBJ, Odell Beckham Jr. looked like prime Odell last week with four receptions on 10 targets for 97 yards and a touchdown as he just fucking did a barrel roll into the end zone. Over the last five games, he has had three top 20 performances and two games outside the top 30. He has yet to enter the safe category, but he's another one of those high upside guys that's in the wide receiver 30 to 36 range. Rashad Master Bateman has been awful this year. I don't even want to talk about it because it kind of makes me a little bit frustrated, but four targets a game just isn't going to cut it for him, so he's an obvious sit. Calvin Ridley without Christian Kirk last week in Cleveland. Calvin Ridley was underwhelming. Now, the targets were there. There was a boatload of them, right? It was like Noah's fucking Ark, where they have like a million, like they've got the sheep, the cow, the horse, the pigs. They've got everything, right? He got 13 targets, but he only had four receptions and 53 yards. Ridley is a fine high-end wide receiver three. I expect him to get fed again, so he should be fine. Zay Jones, to me, is a fringe start. Just like Ridley, he saw a shit ton of targets last week in Cleveland with 14, but he had five receptions for 29 yards. Zay Jones is the last guy in the start rankings, right? So if you want to have an argument with some guy that's like a sit, you're like, I'd rather actually start them over Zay Jones. That's kind of the argument that you could actually make. That would make sense. Parker Washington, after getting his first ever catch in week 13, followed it up with back-to-back -back weeks with a touchdown. He also scored his first touchdown in the first week he um, caught a pass. I think his story is great, right? But fun stories don't result in fantasy points, right? Fun stories don't result in the guy being start worthy. So sit him down. Final game here. Cause you waited all day for Monday night. Nick, that's not the song. We got the battle of the birds. The Eagles at the Seahawks. I think I read somewhere that a Seahawk isn't actually a real bird. Maybe that was fake news, but I don't know. 
kind of blew me. Pause. Kind of shook me. Blew me for a loop. It shook me for a loop. Whatever the fuck the term is there. Kind of led me astray. All right. AJ Brown has been back in the good graces of fantasy owners over the last two games. He has now had back to back 13 target games last week against the Cowboys, despite the fact that they got shellacked in Jerry's world. He had nine receptions on 13 targets for 94 yards against the Seahawks defense. That I don't think is very good. I believe AJ Brown will hit the Seahawks with a Will Smith level smack the front hand, backhand. Shout out Key and Peel, top 12 receiver on the week. Lock it in. Now, last week was Devontae Smith's worst game in weeks. From weeks 8 through 13, he was a top 18 wide receiver every single week. And then last week, he was the wide receiver 33 with five receptions on 10 targets for 73 yards. I think the Eagles look better against the Seahawks, so I believe Smith should be at the very least a top 18 receiver yet again. Olamide Zacchaeus is another one of those guys that will miraculously score a touchdown on two receptions once a season, but you're never going to know when it is, so you got to sit him. For the Seahawks, Metcalf started off last week's game against the 49ers going straight up gangbusters, which is like a term old people use that i think is pretty funny earlier touchdown and uh, earlier touchdown early in the game he scored a touchdown he hit that fucking sign language celebration and after that he didn't do anything besides get ejected two receptions on five targets for 52 yards and a touchdown the eagles defense is in shambles so metcalf should raw dog that defense he should be a top 12 receiver this week now tyler lockett i say this every single week so i don't want to sound like a broken record here but lockett is either going to be the wide receiver 70 or the wide receiver 18 or better every single week if you look up boom or bust in the webster dictionary a picture of lockett's fucking face shows up right Against Philly, the upside is there, but he is just one of those high upside wide receiver three guys. JSN, I love JSN, and while he has been getting better usage recently, you have Lockett and Metcalf on the same team. You got Walker, Charbonnet now. JSN's just the odd man out. I gotta sit him. Thank you guys all so much for watching. If you did end up enjoying today's video, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below while you're down there. Whether you are new to the channel or not, please make sure that you leave a like on today's video. It would help me out a ton. If you guys want to check out the Patreon, I will have my weekly rankings up there on Thursday, as well as I answer every single question on there that you guys may have. It is $7.50 linked in the video description. Love you guys all so much. I hope you have a great rest of your guys' day. And as always, check out one of the videos that are on your screen right now. Love you guys. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. 